Now, the Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Australia at the time, Billy Hughes, insisted he be the representative of Australia and petitioned King George V to allow it. I believe his request was disallowed uh, more than once, um, but his persistence paid off and his request was granted. Um, but Billy Hughes's uh, insistence was for a very good reason. Uh, even though there was some very strong criticism and opposition from Woodrow Wilson on Billy Hughes representing Australia, Billy Hughes knew a new map of the world would also be drawn up and insisted he be there. Also knowing very well the significance of speaking for ourselves would be showing on an international stage in front of the world that the Commonwealth of Australia had come of age and was ready and able to stand on its own as a sovereign nation and kingdom, so to speak. Um, so you're probably wondering what that significance was. Well, the fact that Billy Hughes spoke not just on our behalf, but also the 62,000 plus fallen and the 156,000 wounded, gassed or taken prisoner. And, and I have to add, that was more than 50% of the nearly 417,000 men which enlisted. Um, so that number was quite high. And our ANZAC at, the, at times was used as simple cannon fodder. Um, so this gave us a big voice at that, at that um, signing of the treaty. Uh, you could say. And since it was Billy Hughes speaking for us and not the King of Great Britain and Ireland, this was also very significant in biblical terms. This gave the Commonwealth of Australia the right to self-determination and to stand alone and speak for ourselves. So Billy Hughes, he was actually a bit forceful, you could say, um, while he was there. Uh, he was there to make sure that we got um, not just our say in what happened at the Salis, but also in the drawing up of the new world, uh, new international map, so to speak. Uh, there was talk of a sovereign kingdom of Australia some 50 years earlier. I can't remember the exact date, but I've, I've read that. Um, but at the time it was decided that Australia wasn't ready to be sovereign. And um, Billy Hughes may or may not have known this, but his actions seem to suggest that he did uh, a less known fact today was the influence of this treaty garnered through Wilson's right hand man, a Jesuit and IMF um, propaga propagator Edward House. So Colonel Edward Mandel House never held public office. He was the most important political figure of the 20th century. Colonel House controlled the Wilson administration through the U um, brought the US into the Great War, prolonged World War I, helped write the Treaty of Versailles and led, that led to World War II, aided by the Bolsheviks. Um, he helped JP Morgan organ, organize the Council on Foreign Relations and was a close personal friend of, of Frank Will, Franklin um, D. Roosevelt, American president, ex- Anyway, the events preceding World War I was a perfect opportunity for some to have a sovereign kingdom of Australia brought back in discussions, um, as it was in the Imperial Conferences of 1926. Uh, you can Google this, you'll, you'll find a little bit of information, but not, not a great deal. Um, but in Lord Balfour's letters and, and declaration of 1926, this was very evident. Uh, it was also asked of the British Parliament and King George V to do something about it one way or another. Um, clearly something was done about it because in 1927 a foundation stone for the United Kingdom of Australia was laid at the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne, uh, sealing the, the uh, Kingdom of Australia, United Kingdom of Australia in law forever. Now, uh, this part kind of blew me away a little bit. Um, so, or, or learning this, I should say. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the biblical ramifications of the events at the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, coupled with the facts the blood of 62,000 uh, plus Anzac had fallen in defence of our realm, and that the kingdom was born due to their actions and sacrifice of our Anzac, our Anzac became the fathers or forefathers of the United Kingdom of Australia. Uh, I'll get into more of this a bit later. Um, 
So th this was actually a huge year in the history of our country, of our kingdom. Um, history that our military occupiers wish we forgot. Uh, so lest we forget. Um, King George V was also styled, titled, coronated and crowned as the King of Australia, separate to all his other titles uh, by the Styles and Titles Act 1927. Now, King George was very limited in what he could do, considering he was under administration, but he at least made sure our occupiers played by the rules in play, uh, that being all of the treaties in, in place. Um, and, and those treaties form international law. Um, so this was pretty much all King George V could do because he was under administration, he was being controlled. Um, but you know, at least he uh, stepped outside of the, uh, the box that he was put in and gave us a kingdom. Uh, but anyway, moving on. So in 1931, the Commonwealth of Australia Parliament, which at that time, I believe, was heavily influenced by our occupiers, um, the United States or USA, um, and, and led by the United Nations, uh, which later become, uh, sorry, which was led by the um, League of Nations, which later became the United Nations. Um, and, and they started changing the people of this country in a number of ways. Uh, it started with the, with the school curriculum. Um, they, they changed that or started changing that. Um, our history started to be rewritten, but most detrimental to us, uh, our faith and every, everything pertaining to our faith began to change. But, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. Uh, but in 1931, uh, the uh, IMF or International Monetary Fund was also implemented in this country. And, and that's a system based on debt, um, or better known as credit. Um, this, this was kind of a turning point um, but I, I suggest you read about it um, and I want to keep this video as short as possible so I won't get into it too much um, but, but the IMF certainly started the ball rolling on um, us becoming enslaved um, but I believe the actions of King George V giving us our kingdom and doing his best to keep the military occupiers following the rules infuriated the world bankers, directly contributing to his death in 1933. Um, but, but that part is just my opinion. It, it just seems everything that I know about this particular thing leads me to believe that there was, that number one, he was murdered and um, and, and it was because the um, upset the bankers. Um, so anyway, well, uh, so after the death of King George V, the occupying military um, had an easier run in making way for what was to come, uh, which I'll get to a little bit later. Um, so King Edward VIII was next in line to the throne, but he renounced it uh, in 1936 uh, before he was to be coronated or crowned. Um, now there's a surprising twist associated with that. He didn't just renounce the throne for the throne of the United Kingdom just for himself. He also renounced it for his descendants. Uh, descendants. Um, so uh, a little bit funny as to why he did that, and and you know I have a very good idea why he did that. Uh, and and it will become evident to a lot of you soon. Um, but then enter George the Sixth in nineteen thirty six. Uh, now I haven't seen a lot of reliable factual information surrounding his coronation or his crowning, but one thing that is clear to me, after looking at his heraldry, specifically his coat of arms, he didn't take the imperial Tudor crown that Queen Victoria and King George did at their coronations. And the King is crowned within the Abbey where it is the special privilege of Movietone to record the historic and religious scene. The 900 year old ritual is observed with traditional fidelity. The Dean of Westminster 
brings from the altar the crown of St. Edward, the crown of England to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who, picking it up with scrupulous regard, carries it to the king, sitting robed in cloth of gold on St. Edward's chair. Who form, he crowns King George VI, and the camera catches those significant moments when the king rests, scepters in hand, crown on his head. The king has been crowned. Um, the crown showing on the coat of arms belonging to King George VI is actually the um, St. Edward's crown. Now, I won't get into the history of the St. Edward's crown. I've, I've, I've written quite a bit about it now. Um, but it's yeah, a Catholic crown. Um, so the St. Edward's crown became known as the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, opposed to the imperial crown, which was the crown of Great Britain and Ireland. So there's a, you know, a little bit of a difference there. Um, but apart from King George the Fifth, uh, Sixth showing a different crown to Queen Victoria and King George V, his coat of arms also does not display the same lineage or line of authority as Queen Victoria and King George. So it's clear to me he has a different line of authority under a different crown to King George and uh, King George V and Queen, and Queen Victoria. But some prominent people uh, will tell you that these things are not important. But anyone like myself that has actually taken the time to learn these things, um, they they and and what they represent, they are actually quite important. Um, the crown is not just a fancy hat, as some people would put it. Oh, sorry, yeah, some people say it's just a fancy hat, but it's not. The crown itself is a heraldic device, um, not too different from a coat of arms. Or yeah, they symbolise who or what is being represented. Uh, it could be family lineage, or when carried on a battlefield, it shows whether they are friend or foe. Now, in, in the case of the Imperial Tudor crown, the crown represents the Christian people of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, um, united as the crown. Um, so the people are the Imperial crown. Um, now, Queen Victoria and King George V, when they took that imperial Tudor crown, they were representing the people, the people under that crown who were that crown, not the bankers and certainly not the Catholic Church. Now, crown land is Commonwealth land, or Commonwealth land is crown land, and it belongs to the people. Um, the St. Edward's crown does not represent the same thing as the imperial crown. The St. Edward's crown is actually a Catholic crown, as I mentioned not Christian. If you actually do some research, and I don't mean reading Wikipedia, find some Catholic literature like I did, and you will certainly find that it has Catholic roots and Catholic connections. In fact, uh, Edward, King Edward, um, he, he, was, he was actually a Catholic, and, and that crown was uh, named after him, and, and he was made a patron saint of the Order of the Catholic Church. All Catholic. Nothing Christian in there at all. Um, so the two different crowns cannot represent the same thing. Different faith, different, different belief systems altogether. Not the same crown, they don't represent the same thing. So anybody that tells you the crown is not important, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and, and those people certainly don't know the history between the two faiths and how and why the Anglican Christian faith was started in the first place. Um, but before I get into that, I'll move on to the coat of arms. Uh, most of you are less interested in the coat of arms than you are of the crown. But the coat of arms is rather important as well. Um, as I said, the coat of arms shows who is being represented. Now, in the case of a king or a queen, um, where that king or queen gets their authority from and who they represent is displayed on that coat of arms. And uh, which God they get their authority from by divine right. 
is also displayed on that coat of arms. It, it's a must. Um, but but you know, I'll get on to God later. It's worth worth sticking around for. Uh, and and you know these things are plain as day if you actually take the time to learn these things. Um, now if you look at all the imperial acts between 1688 and the and um, seven up to 1700 and a little bit beyond that, you will see very clear pattern. Catholic influence was not welcome within the imperial realm. I'll say that one more time. Catholic influence was not welcomed in the imperial realm. 